Yeah, so I have a diagnosis of attention deficit hyperactive disorder. I was diagnosed as a child. Um, and so I've kind of been through that journey a little bit, but I have to say that it really started with my son who was mm -hmm. diagnosed with autism at two years and three months. He is my oldest and he is 10 years old now. So we've been through kind of a journey together. Um, and I think at first really when he was diagnosed, it was this overwhelming feeling of, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I don't know. I don't know how to include him in my life now. And I don't know how to include myself into his. Um, I don't know how to feel included as a family even unit because we just felt like things were so different. And I think we focused so much on the different part yeah. at the beginning, especially. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of how I got started with trying to understand um, where to begin. And once we kind of figured out that, you know, the, probably the best piece of advice that I still give a lot of parents is get into their world first. Once we figured that part out um, and really created some magical connection somewhere in just the ways that we could, as soon as that came together, it seems like everything really fell into place. And that's where I started. It's not that everything's been fixed or magically come together, but it did start making, you know, we started creating a connection. There was belonging in our home. All of a sudden we felt like, okay, we have somewhere to start. We know where to go. We have some hope. And, um, and I think then we started focusing a lot more on the similarities between us and a lot of the really great connections and the things that we can do together rather than the things we can't do together. And so that really helped me get into advocating for my son when it came into for school, but also at home, at um, in community events and, and sports as well that he wanted to participate in. And I think from advocating for him, I eventually started advocating for other people that needed extra help. And it kind of grew into me working with a few different nonprofit organizations. And then um, I created a business called Inclusion Project in 2016, mm -hmm. just to start talking about inclusion really with families. Um, and then I published a children's book, a, pi a picture book called Inclusion Alphabet in 2018. And that's really when I started working a lot with teachers and in schools. I would go and read my book and then they'd ask a lot more questions. Okay, how do we include? What does this look like? Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion about what inclusion is. So it was just a really great opportunity for me to be able to come in and kind of start talking a little bit about all sorts of differences. and. Um, I think that's one of the most amazing things too is realizing that inclusion and that all of this really matters to everyone. That we all kind of have something different and something similar to hold on to. That's so interesting you say that because my next question was going to be saying just that, that when I was a teacher for children of special needs, what I discovered was that inclusion. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Did you lose me for a second there? Do I yeah. have you? <laughs> Sorry, Sorry. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear so me? My, yes, I can. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yep, I can. I was just gonna say that I had the exact same experience of realizing that accessibility and inclusion is for everybody. It's not just for the kids who we've identified as needing it, and that right. it makes a safe, workable space for everybody because everybody really does need it, and everybody has. I mean, the only thing we all have in common is that we all have differences, you know? And, so, um, and you also gestured towards, I was going to ask about the inclusion alphabet and ask if you could talk a little bit about that because I've been interested in that project. Yeah, so I wrote this picture book. It took me a while to put it all together, but it, you know, I wanted to kind of put together a set of words that really had a lot to do with inclusion that we could start having more intentional conversations with our families and our students about inclusion. And so inclusion alphabet is a set of 26 words you'll find within the book A through Z that talk about inclusion. And it also has kind of a storyline to it that it talks about, you know, a boy who feels like he has no friends, a little girl who feels different. A man who meets strangers really through the book, and I think it really does. So e is for empathy in the book, um, but we've also got you know T is for teachable, and U is for understanding, and so a lot of really good words just to start explaining to kids. Um, 
some of these words, I will admit, when I go to read this book to kids, a lot of the kids don't really know a lot of the words. I mean, mm -hmm. when I ask them, do you know what empathy means? A lot of the younger kids really don't. Um, and even the word inclusion is something that I'm explaining, whether that's to kids or adults all the time. And so this is just a great opportunity for us to use these words as, okay, let's have conversations. How do I start with inclusion? Well, let's break it down within a lot of different words that we can start addressing and talking about so that we can, we can gain a little bit more um, a, an inclusive mindset as well as just a better understanding of what people are talking about. The idea of using the alphabet as a way to start a conversation with young kids. Because of course, kids of all ages understand these concepts, but they don't have language for it, you know, but kids intuitively are empathetic, you know, and they understand those things. Um, so I love the idea of making that a value from the age when you would read a, an alphabet book. That's great. Yeah. Um, so I, what was I? Oh, so the other question I had was, yeah. You, you've said a lot already that sort of, no, <laughs> um, and I have a feeling you and I could like sit for hours and talk about this stuff, but, um, what would be one thing you'd want people who don't feel familiar with this conversation to know about inclusion beyond the fact that it helps everybody? Uh, we could talk in a minute about sort of examples of how it helps everybody, but what's sort of, um, the takeaway you'd want people to have? You know, I, I do want everyone to understand that inclusion matters to them. And I think once you realize that, you're more on board with helping yep. other people. So I guess that would probably the main be the main thing. Along with that, I teach a lot about that inclusion is not a place, really, but rather it's an opportunity that we're providing. It's a mindset that we're creating. Um, and it's certain rights that we need to be protecting for yep. all. And so those are probably the yeah, I love your what you said made me think of something I saw on your Instagram about um, behavior as communication, parents recognizing or caregivers recognizing that our kids are communicating with us through their behavior. Um, could you say a little bit about that? Because I think that might be helpful to people right now because I'm sure every family's fighting, you know, everybody's having their stresses right now. And so it might be a good time for kind of that reminder of the way that our kids' behavior might be saying something just beyond just what we're hearing. Completely, and I, I do wanna also say, I don't think that that just works with kids. I think that the behavior in general for anyone is <laughs> communication. Um, I know that my stressful, my actions lately have been very um, obvious of I'm stressed, you know, yeah, I'm yeah. overwhelmed. And so as we're seeing those um, behaviors that maybe you feel like, oh my goodness, what's happening? I don't know how to handle this, maybe taking a step back and thinking about, okay, what are they trying to tell me? What could their emotions be saying right now? What is that mm -hmm. about? I know that my son um, has a really hard time expressing his emotions as many kids do in general, but also individuals who have a diagnosis of autism or on the autism spectrum. Um, and you know, sometimes it's really important to remember that it doesn't mean that they don't have those feelings. Mm, they're just yeah. having a hard time expressing them. And so um, we've had a lot of success with using the zones of regulation and finding ways to identify it with colors and having all these great um, tools available. But when we're in a really stressful situation, you kind of hit that fight or flight response. And sometimes that behavior is what is going to show first before you're going to be able to have that successful, yeah. you know, moment of either words or expression of being able to point and say something or whatever that communication is. Um, that you hope for, sometimes it's going to first start as a behavior and which could be a lot of different things. So um, yeah, no, I think it's important to remember that that's for everyone, something that we're, we're all addressing and being aware and kind of conscious about how we're reacting to it can be helpful as well. Yeah. And I just think it's one of those simple <laughs> things uh, that reframes the anger we can feel. I mean, I'm not a parent, but I've been a teacher for a long time at um, children's behavior. And it's really helpful. At, you know, yes, in our own personal lives as adults, it's really helpful, but it's really helpful to remember that a child or a person um, who you don't understand in the moment is communicating something to you, even if it feels like a door slammed in your face, you know, that that is a communication of something. Um, and that even if it's you know, when I was a teacher, one of the learning curves for me was to recognize like, okay, that student isn't 
isn't communicating with me in the way I would like or in a way that society is going to be super welcoming to and we're going to have to work on that but they're expressing their boundaries to me at the very least you know they're telling me something about something's not right here and they need some boundary put in there um so I think that can be really helpful because I'm sure a lot of parents and caregivers right now are just feeling like a little bit angry and isolated themselves and maybe even a little persecuted by their kids' feelings, even though they know that that's not what their kids are trying yeah. to do. You know? it is, it's really hard to not take it personal. Yeah. I think it is really important to take a step out of it and realize, you know, maybe there's something more to this. It's not maybe always directed at you, even though it's coming at you. Yeah. There's something else maybe going on underneath the surface that we haven't addressed enough yet. And that, um, this wasn't one of my planned questions, but it might be helpful to our community. As a parent of someone with an autism diagnosis or a spectrum diagnosis, is that the terminology you use? Yes, that is. So what, um, what would you say you're doing right now to care for yourself? Because I know a lot of members of our community like we have a community board going with a conversation about just being a caregiver right now and what that entails. And, you know, parents of children with special need or caregivers of people with special needs know how much energy and attention and planning goes into a regular day and uh, how exhausting that can be. And then how, do you have any advice about how to sort of balance these new challenges along with the stamina it takes to just be a good parent to someone who has ex extraordinary needs. Completely, yeah. So I think that, you know, we might need to change our expectations a little bit. I think that sometimes you feel like, especially as we're discussing regression, there's a lot of parents that are yeah. so worried about that. But ultimately, you also need to be in a safe place emotionally. And so if you're hitting a wall where you're feeling like I'm trying to, I'm, I have the same goals that I had before this, or I'm dealing with, I'm trying to hit those same expectations, maybe that needs to change a little bit on what yeah. we're going to do. Those goals might need to change a little bit right now. I also think setting boundaries and finding that consistency. If you are feeling like I get really overwhelmed at the same time of day, and that's the moment that you need a break, find a way to maybe use those incentives, whether that's um, technology or whether that's something else that your child can be able to have a little bit of a safe moment without you so you can take a breather and that's okay I think yeah. it's really important to be aware of your healthy limits and you know where that line is um, I also think that making sure that they also feel like they have a safe space somewhere within the home um, one of the first things that when I kind of I've had people say okay well you can you tell me how to create an inclusive space and, you know, one of the first things to ask yourself is, does it feel safe? Mm -hmm. Does it feel safe for everyone around? Um, and not just physically safe, but certainly emotionally safe. And if it doesn't, what are some of those things we can do to try to get to at least that place? Because it's really going to be hard to thrive if it's not a safe environment for you or for your child. And sometimes that's really hard, a, a hard place to get to for some of these kids and for some of these caregivers, but um, it might be a good place to start of how can I, where can my child go to be safe so that I can have a break or where can I go to feel safe at times so that, you know, so that we're not constantly butting heads or feeling so overwhelmed. I love how you're orienting it around people's needs because I think sometimes when you're caring for somebody, it's easy to go into martyr mode and just respond to their needs. And what you're pointing out is that we can all have our needs met, you know, to some degree, and it's not going to be perfect right now. But um, Right. And I think that that goes back to, again, why inclusion matters to everyone. And it does yeah. matter. I need those breaks too. If I'm going to be able to include Logan, my son, if I'm going to be able to include my other kids or anyone else in my community, I also need to feel included. So... Yes. Um, okay. We're so excited, Catherine. Thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate yeah. it. No, thank okay. you. I hope okay, you have a good so day. I'll be in touch. Take care. Take See care. Bye-bye.